Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm Ricardo, I'm a researcher here at ICAREB, uh, and I'll be convening this first session of ICAREB's dialogues uh, of this year, 2021. So welcome everyone. Uh, and just a quick reminder, please, um, um, the session is being recorded. So if you want, please uh, make sure that uh, your cameras are switched off um, and also the sound. Um, so, uh, in a nutshell, the Kareb Dialogues will, will promote conversations with reference researchers and approach various topics, including coastal adaptations, uh, stone tool use, agriculture. Naturally, everyone is, in, is welcome to, to the forthcoming sessions. Um, and, the ses and the schedule uh, can be seen at um, the media pages of the Kareb. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to both two distinguished researchers who focus on human evolution. Susana Carvalho, who is uh, a member of ICAREP uh, and will be the ICAREP speaker for today, and Robert Foley, our guest researcher. Um, uh, and again, Susana will be talking to, to Robert about uh, human origins, and I'll be convening the, this session. Uh, but before we start the session, I would like to introduce you both, uh, Susanna and Robert, uh, to whom I would like to, to thank uh, for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much, Susanna and Robert. So um, I'll start with, with Susanna. I first met Susanna in 2004, actually, when we were doing our master's uh, a long time ago. <laughs> we were doing our master's in human evolution in the University of Coimbra. Uh, then we had to take, we had the opportunity to take an in introductory course to primatology, which was co-organized by our, our professor, Claudia Souza, a reference to us, to us both, who unfortunately has passed away. Um, but in summary, after that, Susanna pursued a career in primatology and paleoanthropology, and she is now a reference researcher in these fields, uh, who is one of the founders of primate archaeology. Um, Susanna has an extensive publication list with over 50 outputs listed in Google Scholar and over 1,200 citations. She has the Primate Models for Behavioral Evolution Lab at the University of Oxford, where she's an associate professor. Uh, Susanna is also director of the Paleoprimate uh, Project in Gurunungosa, Mozambique, um, from which exciting findings and research are emerging. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you here with us, Susanna, um, talking about your research and dialoguing with Robert, uh, who, uh, who I will now introduce. Um, my first contact with, uh, with the research of Robert was uh, roughly in the early 2000s when I was doing my BA in anthropology. Um, I remember reading one of his many, many publications about human evolution. Uh, that book, uh, which was uh, Another Unique Be Species, was a landmark for me. This was about 20 years ago, uh, but I still remember it easily conveying uh, to the non-specialist reader an ecologically integrated perspective of human evolution, uh, just, just as in other evolutionary branches. Uh, in fact, I still quote it often to, 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 to other people. <laughs> uh, this book is just one of the innumerable uh, outputs of, of Robert, which are very difficult to quantify. So once again, I used the help of Google Scholar and found that Robert has over 260 outputs listed there, uh, along with nearly 15,000 citations. Uh, this outstanding productivity is coupled with multiple research projects in Africa, also in the Solomon Islands, uh, which have been supported by many fund by the main funding agencies, including the European Research Council, the Leverhulme Trust, the, um, the British Academy. Robert is undisputedly one of the main references in human evolution research. He has taught in the University of Durham and the University of Cambridge. Uh, at Cambridge, he co-founded the, the Leverhulme Center uh, for Human Evolutionary Studies, which is a reference center as well in paleoanthropology. So once again, it's a pleasure to have you here with us, Robert, talking about uh, the origins of humans and of human behavior. Um, Thank you. And uh, yes, <laughs> welcome. Uh, and uh, I would just like uh, to let people know that you are free to use the chat to, to ask questions. Uh, and in the end, we will pass them on to both Susanna and Robert. Okay, so. Thank you. <laughs> welcome. 
Shall we start the presentations then? Uh, yes, if I can find the presentation. <laughs> Sorry, small text. No worries. Let's see. Can you see this now? Yep. Yeah, you can see the lovely Rob Foley, yeah? Yeah, okay. Hang on. Yes. Um, <laughs> I just, sorry, I need... <laughs> sorry, this is my first time, everyone. So... <laughs> Hang on. Okay. Hello, bonjour. It's a great pleasure to uh, be part of this, uh, this dialogue uh, with Susanna Cavaglio and uh, Ricardo Godinho. And what I'm hoping we can do in this is to raise a number of uh, interesting questions which spread across the whole range of the ways in which we want to study human evolution. So I'm going to bring in some uh, aspects of apes, uh, some evolutionary processes, uh, think about behavior, and in particular about diversity. To misquote Jane Austen in Pride and Prejudice, it is a truth universally acknowledged that humans evolved in Africa, and that is the, really the starting point for uh, everything that I want to talk about. Uh, the evidence for that comes uh, partly from uh, our very close relationship uh, with African apes, uh, shown genetically, but of course uh, pointed to many years ago by Charles Darwin himself. Uh, the fact that most of the hominins, uh, most of the hominin taxa that we know are, are African in uh, distribution and indeed African in origin, uh, and also in particular with modern humans, uh, that uh, the genetic and the fossil and the archaeological evidence all points to an African origin in the Middle Pleistocene with only much later dispersals into uh, Eurasia. And it gives rise to, to, the, to, to the idea that uh, Africa is absolutely central and is the, the critical area in which we have to think about uh, hominin evolution. And it's not just that there is diversity there and the genetics, but also nearly all the primary uh, evidence for major changes in hominin evolution occur first in Africa. And we can go right back to the earliest hominins, which uh, are known in Africa from seven and a half million years ago, through to the uh, first evidence for tool making, the Lamequian at 3.3, uh, evidence for uh, the genus Homo, for Homo agaster or erectus, uh, the Ashelaean, we can go on and on, uh, all the way through to the evidence for uh, the, the, the evolution of what we call modern human behavior. So it's quite clear that Africa is central uh, to the whole process. So I want to pick up on that and, and think about it in a slightly different way uh, in, in the course of the, this, this discussion. And there are three elements I want to bring into this. Uh, one is thinking about the role of the African environment uh, and then really thinking about differences uh, that might be important there. I want to talk about patterns of evolutionary diversity uh, that we see uh, amongst hominins. Uh, uh, and I want to link that in uh, to what we know about uh, uh, behavior and diversity, particularly diversity amongst African apes. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that uh, evolutionary diversity, uh, that is, however you measure it, number of taxa, number of species uh, that, that occur in a particular region, is a critically important signal uh, for evolutionary processes in general. And we need to understand uh, what is going on, the, the, the actual history of diversity across different lineages. And that's something Darwin himself recognized. I mean, he, 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 his one and only diagram. Uh, the famous uh, diagram in, in The Origin of Species and the one in his notebook, shows that he saw evolution as a process of diversification. So we have to understand that diversification. And we can bring to it a range of, uh, of, of uh, approaches, uh, archaeology in terms of diversity of behavior, uh, diversity of, of, of cultures and, and industries, whatever we want to call them. We can think in terms of comparative biology uh, and look at what uh, the diversity of living apes or even going beyond that, primates and mammals more generally can tell us. 
Uh, we can study it in the fossil record and look at the comings and goings of different uh, lineages, uh, species. And of course, increasingly, we can use genetics uh, as uh, uh, insights, particularly into those species which have uh, a very limited fossil record. And uh, what brings this all together is, of course, uh, evolutionary ecology, the idea that what generates diversity is the environment, and we, must, we want to map that. So that's the theme I want to, uh, to, to really pursue, is getting at, at, at aspects of hominin and ape diversity in Africa in the last few million years. Now, when we talk about the uh, idea that Africa is central to hominin evolution, it's what I like to call the Afrotropical model of hominin evolution, uh, uh, which places it into a biogeographic context. And there are a number of reasons for thinking that Africa uh, is likely to generate uh, 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 diversity, early appearances of things, uh, to, to be what um, uh, Michael Fortilius has called a species factory. Uh, and certainly we can think, uh, looking across this diagram, hominins are part of the uh, African evolutionary community as a whole. They're evolving as part of that. Uh, there are barriers that come and go, in particular the Sahara, which both isolates and, and links Africa to other uh, continents, uh, creating corridors, creating uh, barriers, uh, which, which are important. It has a particular position adjacent to Eurasia so that there are uh, routes out of it. It has particular topographies, uh, areas of, of high diversity, high relief, which can generate uh, lots of different ecological niches. Uh, it has uh, the critical importance of water as a constraint which constrains distribution and can create isolation, uh, can create con uh, conditions under which diversity uh, can occur. Uh, and of course it is itself an enormous continent uh, made up of forests, deserts, savannas, creating the sort of habitat diversity uh, that is important. And the uh, importance of Africa as uh, a, a, as a centre for evolutionary diversity has nothing in practice to do with hominins. This is a, a broader evolutionary issue. And we can see the maps here that show the, the, the hot spots for mammalian diversity around the world. And quite clearly, the two hot spots that, that, that stand, stand out are the Neotropics uh, and the Afrotropical region. And so this fits into the idea that it's the tropics, it's the nature of tropical environments that generate uh, diversity. And that's true whether you take a simple measure of diversity or put it into a phylogenetic uh, context. So what is happening at an evolutionary scale and in terms of the evolutionary processes involved? And the answer is a relatively simple one, uh, and we can see uh, in the graphs here, <clears throat> that if you just take the two components, speciation rate and extinction rate, uh, the tropics have a higher speciation rate, shown in, in tropics in green here, and temperate zones have uh, a lower one. And conversely, uh, there is a higher rate of extinction in temperate zones than in tropical ones. And that creates uh, the situation where the overall diversification rate, speciation minus extinction, is higher in the tropics. And that explains the pattern we see. It also helps explain uh, dispersal because it, as there is a, a, a higher rate of new species arising in the tropics, then there is a greater uh, possibility or probability of dispersals uh, both across the tropics, across Africa and into Eurasia uh, because of the higher probability of new adaptations arising. So that in terms of biogeographical patterns, uh, hominins uh, fit very nicely. Uh, the, the, the extraordinarily good fossil record, I know we don't often think that way, but the extraordinarily good fossil record of hominins uh, indicates that there uh, have been uh, probably at the order of uh, 25 to 30 different taxa. We can argue about exactly what that, those taxa mean in terms of biological processes, but a high level of diversity. Uh, and, and that it's sustained across time. In the, in the, the, the graph on the right, you can sh see quite clearly uh, that it's hard to find a period when there isn't uh, some level of diversity across the hominin lineage. And indeed, the current period where there's only one species uh, is, is extraordinarily rare, if not unique. And, uh, and that reflects 
a changing pattern of uh, speciation, the divergences we can see on the left, uh, over, over time. Now, we, it's a complicated thing to see at this level, but we can uh, reduce it down to uh, a simpler thing by just looking at first appearance data, uh, 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 fossils and last appearance data, which are proxies of um, speciation and extinction, uh, and we can look at the number of taxa in place at any one period of time. And, and the diagram here uh, expresses that, and you can see there, there are uh, pulses, there are periods when there's relatively high uh, novelty coming in, I'm noticing it in particular uh, around about two million years, very high levels of appearance. Uh, and extinction uh, has a similar pattern, although not surprisingly, uh, uh, tends to be slightly asynchronous to the, to the appearance data. And what that produces is an interesting pattern of diversi diversity of hominins across time in which uh, they're relatively low uh, at the outset. Uh, they are, uh, they peak during the early Pliocene or increase during the early Pliocene, peaking uh, as we move into the lower Pleistocene, decline, and then there's this interesting uh, uh, reappearance of high levels of diversity in the middle, uh, Ply in the middle Pleistocene. And that, of course, is partly to do uh, with the expansion and greater significance of Eurasian hominids uh, across that period. So here is uh, that pattern of diversity across the last uh, six million years or so. Uh, and of course it provides us with uh, substantial evidence for the dynamic nature of, of hominin evolution. And we can uh, have attempts to try and link this to uh, changes in climate, perhaps uh, the early part related to the expansion of savanna environments, C4 uh, grasslands and so on uh, during the, the Pliocene and early Pleistocene, and perhaps the later changes uh, related to the onset of, uh, in, in, of, of cooler climates and, and glacial glaciation, uh, the climatic oscillations of the, of the Pleistocene, or we could link it into adaptive changes that perhaps the appearance of new phenotypes and new behaviours are driving uh, both the appearance of new taxa and the extinction of older ones. And that seems to be a fairly straightforward pattern. But I want to uh, raise a, a, a different question by uh, thinking about what I'm calling here the African ape enigma. So the diagram on the right is a phylogenetic tree uh, which may or may not reflect the, the true relationships amongst hominins, but it is nonetheless probably something close to what, what happened. And on the left uh, we have uh, the African apes, uh, the gorilla and the chimpanzee, and what we know about them. Uh, and it's remarkably different. Well, why should we have such a difference between the, uh, the, the, the hominins and the African apes? Well, one obvious reason uh, is that we simply haven't found the fossil record. The apes live in tropical rainforests primarily. Uh, these are areas that are hard to explore. Uh, they have low uh, potential for the preservation of fossils, uh, and they've been relatively understudied. So perhaps under all these trees uh, lies a wealth of, of diversity. Um, but as it currently stands, we simply uh, don't know that. Uh, the second uh, possibility uh, is that paleoanthropologists just aren't very good at their job, and they have, uh, you know, taken every little bump in, uh, in in a skull and used that to create uh, excessive numbers of taxa, uh, and that they should, uh, in, in preference, uh, switch to being uh, lumpers. So uh, th those are the possibilities. I think we can gain uh, new insights, however, into what might have been going on uh, by turning to genetics. We now have a wealth of evidence, from not just uh, human genetics, but also ape genetics as well. And there are a range of papers uh, showing uh, the diversity uh, and mapping that diversity in its evolutionary and historical uh, context. Now, just to put this uh, in, 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 into context to clarify, uh, we're talking here about uh, uh, three main uh, groups, uh, the uh, chimpanzee, uh, the bonobos, and the gorillas. But I want to emphasize here much more, uh, not the species necessarily, uh, but the geographical units uh, that make them up. And in some cases, people uh, will place it at species level, at others at subspecies level. It doesn't really matter. This is the, the point is that we can recognize geographical diversity, which creates a, a larger number of units. So there is actually a, a, a considerable diversity of African apes looked at at this level today. 
Genetics has indicated that indeed that might be an underestimate. Uh, a recent paper uh, has shown that um, uh, there is evidence that uh, bonobos in particular uh, uh, add mixed uh, with a now extinct population uh, of pan, uh, a, a lineage which predated the divergence of uh, pan troglodytes, the common chimpanzee, and pan paniscus, uh, the bonobo. And that would be the first evidence that there was greater uh, diversity of apes out there in the past than there currently is. Uh, and I should just put in, in this context that, that, that the uh, similar papers have also begun to show uh, that there is uh, some admixture between the various lineages uh, which can create complexity that we can uh, discuss and talk about. But I want to emphasize the diversity at this stage. So we have some insights here. Uh, that it's not quite as simple as it looks. However, I think uh, we need to get at this in a slightly more uh, quantifiable way. And so what I've done here is to just create a tree, it's a standard tree of, uh, of, of the uh, African apes. So we've got gorillas in the left-hand branch and the four uh, species or subspecies uh, uh, that, that constitute them. I put hominins in there. And we've got the extinct uh, species of pan, then bonobos, and then we've got the four subspecies of, uh, pan, of pan troglodytes, virus, iliotti, troglodytes, and schweinfurthi. And what we can see as we go down, as you create this tree, is the various levels of diversity. So what I want to look at is what do we know about the ages of those diversities, of, the, of these, these coalescence points and diversification. So what this diagram shows is, is I've extracted as much of the uh, molecular genetic evidence that there is uh, for uh, all f f for pan. So this is both pan troglodytes and uh, pan paniscus, the bonobo, and divided it up into uh, those different levels, those diversity levels I just showed you. So subspecies, geographical lineages, species, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, and then what the y-axis shows is the uh, is the estimates for coalescence points or last common ancestors for those different subspecies. It doesn't matter at all what they are at this stage. And these are multiple. I've just used every piece of evidence I have. So it's the same things recorded. And you can see quite clearly uh, that um, the, uh, th th there is a pattern there, not surprisingly, that as we go from left to right, to deeper into the di levels of diversity, uh, those ages increase. What I want to do, though, is to uh, not worry so much about the ages of species appearance uh, and, and focus on uh, the more specific ones. So I've just highlighted here uh, geographical lineages and subspecies. And the critical point here is that this chimpanzee diversity is very young. So if we look at when the subspecies uh, uh, evolved and when the geographical lineages, so this, that's east versus west, uh, it's all basically in the middle Pleistocene, uh, or, or, or less than a million years ago. There are some outliers, uh, but it looks as if the, the, the diversity of chimpanzees we see today uh, is relatively young. And indeed, the bonobo, if we were to include that, which shows uh, very little diversity within itself, um, is, is, is probably only a million or a million and a half uh, years in age itself. So in other words, chimpanzees may have a history going back uh, five, six, seven million years, but all we're seeing in terms of their diversity is something that has evolved in the last uh, million years or possibly even in the last uh, half million years. What happens when we look at gorillas? Uh, we see exactly the same pattern, perhaps even more exaggerated. Uh, same same uh, uh, use of data here, um, and we can see that the subspecies, uh, which are the four uh, groups, uh, uh, don't go back uh, more than uh, 400,000 years, and the geographical lineages uh, are, are of the same. So in other words, it, the gorillas as we understand them today have really only expanded across the continent in the last three or four hundred thousand years. Let's, let's assume the data has errors on it and say in the last half million years. And again, given they have a, an evolutionary history going back seven, eight, nine million years, this is really quite an extraordinary observation. 
I've put this into uh, a, a, a different form of graph here. So I've now taken the median points for all those diverse estimates and just plotted them against time there. Uh, and the, 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 the triangles, the red triangles are gorillas and the, the blue uh, circles are chimpanzees. And you can see reassuringly that the, the deeper the level of diversity, the older the age. Uh, and there's actually quite an interesting uh, pattern which I, I haven't really explored. Uh, 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 it, it occurs relatively uh, progressively, so it, it, it flattens off. But the, the diversity we see today for both lineages is essentially uh, very young and occurs in the Pleistocene. Which of course uh, makes one ask the question, what on earth were the chimpanzees and the gorillas doing uh, for the previous five, six million years of their existence? Now I've brought this together in, uh, with, with the hominin data and we can see the contrasting patterns with hominins at the top showing this uh, deeper diversity, a complex pattern. Uh, but notice, of course, that, the, the, that there is a rise of diversity. So the, the diversity we know in hominins today is itself young. What we can see is the depth uh, uh, of, through the fossil record, which is absence for the apes. Um, and, and that might be the, the answer that if we had the fossil record for the gorilla and pan, uh, they would show uh, the same sort of pattern and, and, and we could then explore uh, that diversity. But it's nonetheless striking uh, with a long evolutionary history stretching over millions of years, uh, the gorillas and the chimpanzees have shown relatively uh, recent diversification, uh, which presumably means uh, that a lot has been lost. And I'll come back to that uh, later on in this, in, in this discussion. Uh, and one can just note perhaps that it looks as if the gorilla, the diversity in gorillas is younger than that of, of, of chimpanzees. And that may be something to do with the nature of their more forested uh, adaptations and forest habitats. Now I thought it might be uh, useful just to, to have a quick look at the, the baboons to see whether they just show the same pattern or, or not. Uh, so I, I carried out exactly the same analysis uh, and approach to, to baboons and we can see the chart there. I've then uh, tacked that on to the, to, to the apes and, and the hominids here and one can see Again, now this doesn't show the, the, the Papier fossil record, which is of course quite rich uh, and, and would probably mimic the pattern of the hominins quite well. Uh, but we, the interesting point is that baboons genetically uh, have shown uh, their, their diversification is more ancient uh, than that of the apes. Uh, and, that, uh, and, and, and whether that means um, apes generally diversified much later or whether it means that extinction rates have been much higher amongst apes is something uh, that we need to perhaps uh, think about. Um, so I, what, what do we learn from this? Uh, well, firstly, evolutionary diversity is very variable across time and between lineages, and that is a signal of history that we need to investigate and, in, and interpret. So into the importance of diversity as a, an evolutionary signal. Uh, what the hominins show, show quite clearly is the importance of a fossil record um, that, that this shows a much richer and more complex pattern of evolutionary history than we're ever going to get uh, from just studying uh, genetics. Obviously ancient DNA uh, may change this in various ways. Uh, but it also shows the incredible importance of looking at genetics if we want to understand evolutionary history even when we don't have fossils uh, because there is information out there which we can use. So what does this all mean? What's the significance of it? And, and does it really matter? Uh, does it, and does it matter in particular? I know many of you are archaeologists. Does it matter uh, in, in, in trying to understand the archaeological record and the evolution of, of human behavior? And I think uh, the answer is yes, regardless of, uh, of, of one's interest in, in chimpanzees uh, and gorillas. I think there's a broader uh, lesson to be learned from this. And I want to just uh, touch briefly on four of these. The first of these is the significance of extinction in evolution and in hominin and hominid evolution in particular. We tend to always you know, think about the appearance of new things and, 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 and occasionally taxa go extinct. I know currently we're having a major extinction crisis. But I think it's important to recognize that uh, the disappearance and the extinction of hominins is, is an important part of the, of the whole 
process uh, and that we've probably underestimated that significance uh, across time. Um, and uh, I've just got some graphs up here just to show, uh, for example, last appearance data, uh, a proxy for extinction for hominin taxa, uh, and you can see that it's a pretty constant process that things are always disappearing. Uh, and, uh, and, and equally, uh, there's a strong relationship in, in the central graph here between extinction uh, rates and overall diversity rates, and, and, and that uh, where it, when extinction uh, is relatively high, it tends often followed by uh, increases of, ex of, of, of diversification. Uh, presumably, a speciation not plotted here is increasing. And uh, this is the sort of process that has been studied more broadly in evolution, which we need to think about. And it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about biological uh, uh, groups here or we're looking at cultural traditions. The process is the same in which the disappearance of diversity is uh, a critical part of, of the process and we, we, we probably greatly underestimated that. The second thing I want to uh, raise, which I think is particularly important uh, for archaeologists, is the role of behavior in generating diversity. I mean our classic view of speciation, in other words the, the, the way in which diversity arises, could either be that it's produced by allopatry where populations uh, separated and then they evolve different phenotypes, uh, or it can be driven by genetic changes in which new mutations arise, creating new op opportunities and new selective uh, landscapes. But an equally important model uh, is one where it is changes of behavior which tend to come first and that they drive uh, then either the ability to disperse into new environments and, there, and therefore to diversify uh, allopatrically or to uh, uh, create the selective pressures under which new phenotypes evolve. And there's quite a lot of evidence across biology uh, that behavior uh, is often the precursor of other evolutionary changes. This is sometimes referred to as the Baldwin effect. Now the complexity we see in hominin evolution, uh, and I've illustrated on the right just with, we, we look at with modern human evolution, where we've got phenotypic changes and behavioral changes and genetic changes, none of which are necessarily terribly clearly uh, synchronous, uh, might indicate that big changes in behavior might be driving the complexity of hominin evolution, which makes it particularly important um, for us to think about uh, uh, what is going on amongst the apes. Does their lack of diversity reflect perhaps much less uh, behavioral innovation uh, uh, taking place or is it that the extinction rate uh, of, hominin, of, of the apes, the hominids, uh, and the recent nature of, of ape diversity uh, is something where behavior has actually changed rapidly and that we simply can no longer observe it. Now that becomes terribly important for one of the big questions that, that uh, many people, and, and, and uh, Susanna is, is one of the most important in this respect, thinking about uh, African apes and, and the last common ancestor uh, that we must share with them, and therefore what uh, African apes can tell us about uh, uh, that last common ancestor and the ancestral conditions under which hominins evolve. And I think what the recency of the diversity means is we have to think very carefully about how we inf make any inferences about uh, the past. And I just refer here to a paper that uh, Keegan Yaxley, uh, PhD student, and I published uh, a, a couple of years ago, in which we uh, decided to look at uh, a whole range of traits, and these were behavioral traits as well as um, uh, 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 phenotypic traits, and we included cultural traits as well. And, and tried to build trees of these using the subspecies or the, the, the minimal taxonomic units at any rate of the different taxa because we recognized that in, 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 we had to do that first before we could settle and think well what might be ancestral in the past and, and what, is, what is reassuring is when one looks across the various traits is that there is a strong phylogenetic signal uh, in, in these things so the subspecies uh, do uh, share uh, similar traits at every level in relation their, to their degree of relatedness. But it does raise the question of then how do we go back and make uh, inferences further. So I think the lesson there, uh, and I'll be very interested to hear Susanna's comments on this, is that we have to be quite careful in how we treat chimpanzees as 
uh, as, 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 as uh, representatives of the last common ancestor or as uh, convergent and parallel evolution or divergent evolution without thinking quite closely about the within species or the within genus variation uh, that we see. Finally, I've spent some time discussing the extent to which uh, chimpanzee evolution, gorilla evolution and diversity is a relatively recent event. And of course that needs putting into the context that the same is true of humans as well. The genetics indicates uh, that human diversity is, is, is limited and therefore we have a relatively uh, young species age. And this therefore maps on quite nicely to the, to the, to the chimpanzees. And indeed when we think about modern humans and we keep talking about the evolution of modern humans, I suppose we, we now in the light of some of this evidence should be asking should we really be talking about the evolution of modern chimpanzees and modern gorillas and uh, begin to think about what archaic forms might have been like. But the other thing uh, is that if what has shaped that uh, genetic tree is high levels of extinction in apes, it's also the case uh, that that has happened in, in humans. And I, I won't emphasize it here. Uh, Marta Mirazon La uh, has written extensively on this, and her paper in, in, in 2016 showed quite clearly uh, how uh, patterns of hominin diversity that have uh, fluctuated uh, in the last uh, half million years or quarter of a million years or so uh, have been both about diversification but also uh, loss of lineages and extinction and that is true uh, it, 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 it's true that, that uh, in, hom in humans hominins uh, there is evidence for minor admixture and it's probably the case that that same slightly more complex pattern uh, occurs in chimpanzees as well and there's evidence for gene flow and admixture uh, uh, in, in across the chimpanzee subspecies which is perhaps not that surprising. And so uh, we perhaps need to think uh, a little bit more about how the fact that chimpanzees, gorillas and modern humans all uh, co-evolved during the Middle Pleistocene and what that might mean uh, for African evolution generally. So to sum up, uh, firstly uh, I think that uh, taking a comparative approach and considering humans and chimpanzees uh, uh, and, and gorillas uh, not just as having a, a deep ancestral relationship but having co-evolutionary patterns uh, during the Pleistocene uh, is an important uh, way we should start to think about the issues and that it's the shifting patterns of evolutionary diversity that are the important signals uh, of evolutionary history and the processes underlying them. Secondly that it was only really by applying multi-proxy approaches that allowed us to see how these differences emerged and beginning to contrast patterns that we see through genetics and ones that we might see through the fossil record. Uh, although ultimately uh, what we really need uh, is a better fossil record for the apes. And lastly, uh, hominin evolution involves uh, extinction. We know that from the number of uh, taxa that have disappeared and the fact that we're the only one that still survives. And it's likely that uh, this is not just a hominin characteristic but it is a hominid characteristic as well. And so we need to think about the African context uh, for uh, evolution and extinction of the hominids uh, across quite a long period of time. So thank you very much for listening and I very much look forward uh, to uh, hearing what Susanna and Ricardo have to say. Uh, and I just hope that the next time uh, we have such a talk, it can be in person rather than uh, uh, online. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, boa tarde, muito obrigada pelo convite. It's a huge uh, honor, uh, true pleasure to be here today uh, to follow up on uh, uh, Rob Foley, uh, the origins of human behavior uh, dialogue. So today I'm talking about part two, uh, call it, I call it identifying bias and minding the gap. Um, I look forward to the discussion. 
Um, and I'm hoping that my and Rob's talk uh, really translate into a real dialogue and that by tackling complementary aspects, we can actually somehow help bridging the gap of knowledge and maybe offer some novel directions of research to help us investigate these many long-standing issues uh, around our behavioral origins. I really didn't want to make my talk a reply point by point to Rob's talk. Uh, instead, I think I will be trying to offer some answers to his uh, very interesting and challenging questions, like why are African apes less diverse than hominins? Are they? And how can we use PAN as a model for evolutionary processes, knowing all the biases in its distinct evolutionary history? As an archaeologist turned primatologist, then turned paleoanthropologist, I cannot think of evolution really without thinking of modern ecology and animal behavior. So I thought we would start here doing a paleoecological reconstruction exercise uh, together. Join me in a modern environment. Uh, in a Rift Valley setting, Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, very much analogous to where many fossils come from, uh, come from in the rest of the of the Rift Valley, um, and this is a composition. So it's a it's a composite picture uh, of all the animals that have visited this waterhole in one day. So think hominin time and. Think that this scene probably happened multiple times during hominin uh, evolution and daily uh, life, but what would get fossilized from what you're seeing here? Uh, for example, you are seeing the birds. There are many birds. They are very abundant, but we know that they get less fossilized than other mammals with stronger bones. Would the fossil record capture this diversity, the relative abundance, rank order, etc.? What about species that may be around, but may not be so dependent on water holes for water, like, for example, prosimians or the Samango monkeys, uh, or predators like carnivores uh, that are absent here, but that's probably because they have just different uh, uh, activity patterns um, than, for example, primates. Um, it captures really high diversity in one day, this, this, this uh, picture, um, and we could look at baboons here as uh, representing hominins in the sense that they would also, like the baboons, be part of a broader ecosystem. And that ecosystem is really difficult to ascertain from the fossil record. So in a way, you want to think of the species that are here, but also the ones that are not here and are part of the ecosystem. Um, and so I think when most people think about hominins, people tend to think about these skulls floating in space, but it is much closer to a real picture that we need to have um, when, when we look at something like this. Hominins as part of a complex um, system, uh, relationships, predator-prey, sympathy, symbiotic relationships between primates and other animals. So basically co-evolutionary relationships. Um, think also about these are, 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 are the product of camera traps. So camera traps get a narrow static visual window. So many species are probably uh, uh, here to the left and the right of the image, but we cannot see it. So I find this a wonderful analogy of the bias or the multiple bias that we have uh, of the fossil uh, record. Okay, but uh, the origins of human or hominin behavior really coincide with the origins of hominins, at least when you think about traits like bipedalism, dietary adaptation, some life history traits, and even Toulouse. Why not? Darwin postulated that Toulouse and bipedalism co-evolved. So uh, the data <clears throat> slowly coming out is actually indicating a, a trend towards uh, this direction. So to discuss hominin behavioral origins, it's central to take a step back and think what we would like to know or what we need to know. And where we come from seems quite obvious. Rob is right, is Africa. Uh, but where and where in Africa, we don't know. Uh, when, it's another problem that I'm going to talk more uh, um, later in the talk, 
uh, the lack of fossil record for great apes and the, insert the incertitude with earliest hominins does not help at all to answer this question. Uh, how, so what analogous ecological settings may trigger adaptations like bipedalism to use hunting terrestriality in primate species that are not known to habitually display these traits? Um, so we don't have the answers yet to this. And why is this so difficult to get? Multiple reasons, but uh, one key is the limitation of molecular data, fossil data, uh, narrow focus on, um, on, on this type of data and not enough work with modern ecology and modern animal behavior. This is my opinion, uh, obviously. Uh, and one of the limitations also is that paleoanthropologists generally don't do much uh, of the geography or biogeography. Um, uh, and, and so I would suggest that we take a look at the biogeography and climate during the period where we believe we originated in the late Miocene. Miocene. And here you have a, a vegetation map of Africa, this different uh, time periods, and you can see that until um, the middle Miocene, you have this continuous tropical forest, megathermal, extending from west to east Africa. Um, and as proposed by um, Jonathan Kingdom and uh, also more recently uh, in a different uh, uh, approach and version by uh, Jose Jordans, um, uh, the, 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 the early and middle Miocene apes would have uh, occupied uh, these uh, forests. So when you look here at uh, this other map, um, it's showing this expansion and contraction of these arid corridors between these two different poles, so the one northeast, northeastern Somali arid region, and then the southwestern Namib arid region, right? Um, what is what what this uh, um, expansion and contractions are um, producing is this uh, forest fragmentation um, in the Miocene, um, and leading to the coastal forests being separated from these central forests. Uh, when these arid zones expand, right? And so this would lead to fragmentation of populations and speciation, hypothetically. Um, and these coastal populations uh, could potentially recolonize the Rift Valley through using um, the river basins such like this one. So here you can see um, ecologically discrete interlands and riven basins inland from the east coast forest strip. And these interlands might have sheltered, according to uh, uh, Kingdom, uh, distinct hominins and other mammals in the past. So, as I was saying, these ideas from uh, Kingdom and more recently from uh, Jordans uh, really make, make me think. So, were hominins here during uh, the, the, the period of uh, divergence of speciation, let's say. Um, so were hominins here first during uh, this period where they would be more likely to have shared the ecosystem with other African apes? Uh, also, was the migration dispersal inland the real bar barrier that basically changed the, the, the evolutionary uh, course in terms of having hominins going inland and other African apes remaining in these um, uh, coastal forests. Um, the presence of fossil papionin at hominin sites um, may indicate that these ecosystems where we are finding hominins were calling for generalist adaptations, right? So highly adaptable ecological primates, um, which both hominins and um, today baboons are, um, were the African apes that were contemporaneous with hominins living in coastal forests or in the forests around the tropical belt uh, of Africa. Uh, so these are all 
uh, questions that I have and that were raised by um, reading um, these hypotheses. Uh, but uh, uh, kingdom hypothesis is more than an hypothesis because actually uh, there is plenty of evidence from uh, other uh, mammals in biogeographic evidence uh, that this hypothesis actually is, imp is empirical, um, empirically tested when you look at certain species. Uh, so, like I was saying, maybe hominins speciated first in these coastal forests of Africa that were shared with other apes, then dispersed and evolved to be much less specialized in terms of diet and habitat suitability, which is something that modern chimpanzees um, uh, find difficult to uh, to 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 adapt to. I will talk a little bit about that if I have the time. Um, but really, to test this idea, uh, we would need to find those fossils. We also need to dig in locations outside the mainstream areas that so far have been explored by uh, a paleoanthropologists in Africa. So this figure here uh, just illustrate with the example of the Sunni antelope. Uh, the closest relative is located in Central Africa, um, uh, so really giving strength to this biogeographic um, hypothesis. Let's talk. This simple uh, construct, uh, contrast of pictures is really um, the idea of illustrating gaps and bias, and this is the 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 bias the bias that we have of the gaps of areas ex that we explore, okay? So we assume there are no fossils in these areas, the area like uh, um, the Gorongosa on the left, uh, the same way that we assume there are no fossils in uh, uh, tropical forests in the sense the tropical forests we have around the tropical belt of Africa. Um, but as we know from our experience in Gorongosa, yes, it's much more uh, difficult to find those fossils uh, when compared to the wonderful time you have walking over millions of fossils uh, in settings like uh, the one on the right, but they are there. Um, and so uh, completely uh, debunking this myth that these highly vegetated areas uh, are not prone to fossilization and don't normally bear fossiliferous uh, deposits. So this is something I think important to highlight. Let's talk about uh, first appearance dates and last appearance dates because this may be critical uh, when we want to measure diversity and just raise the possibility that this may not be the best proxies for extinction and speciation events. Um, so when you see there, uh, what you see in this uh, diagram, uh, you see the time, so the first appearance date and last appearance date, and then you see the uh, confidence interval uh, in a dotted line. Uh, and basically, just looking at the Ceylanthropus as a, an example, uh, you, you you consider Ceylanthropus uh, uh, abundance, and you consider the abundance of the record before uh, uh, the first appearance, and you know it's rare in relation to uh, other mammalian fauna, and do you know there are no other sites around, and you estimate a confidence interval based on um, the next closest site where you have uh, fossils dated. In this case, it's a uh, nine, mi nine million year old site. And so basically what this is saying is that we have no clue if there were hominins before Cylanthropus because it's such a small sample and it's such a rare, um, a rare um, uh, fossil in relation to the, the, the rest uh, of the of the fauna. So I think this is um, a constraint and we need to really be open to consider that Ceylanthropus is 70, 7 million years, could be 8, could be 9, could be even beyond that. And continuing in the, the topic of the uh, first appearance date and last appearance date, uh, looking at this diagram here, if you take into account those uh, confidence intervals that I showed before. So if you count, uh, if you consider that, for example, Cylanthropus uh, is uh, present at eight or nine million years ago, potentially, then the earliest hominins would have actually coexisted with some of the remaining remaining African apes, as you see there, like uh, Shororopithecus or Samburopithecus. Um, and we would have to consider those when measuring 
non-human African ape diversity. Um, and remember, these are all recent discoveries, maybe 15, from 15 years ago, more or less. So very recent feelings of, of gaps in the record. Another point I would like to raise here is the problem of, of potentially problem of diversity measured by um, species or genus uh, at the species versus genus level, right? So I think when you look at diversity, looking at um, the species level, it may be a little bit more arbitrary than looking at diversity, uh, focusing on genus only, which I think is something most paleontologists or paleontologists mostly do because is uh, a, a little bit less arbitrary. Um, as we can, I think, uh, see from the uh, lumper splitter problem. Uh, and so if we look at dominance from, the, from that perspective, from uh, the genus level, then diversity would, all, would also be much lower, right? Um, and the last point I would like to make here is that I think uh, a behavioral diversity, anyway, seems to me very unlikely to correlate with taxonomic diversity. When I think about pan, and I think about modern humans today, uh, this doesn't seem to make um, a lot of sense. Here we have another bias. Another bias is just showing this graph, the, 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 the late Miocene gap. So uh, the number of sites from the time of hominin origins is very low. And for that time period that is labeled as the late Miocene gap is practically absent, basically. So we can also ask if diversity is recent, what do we know about the LCA? Rob talked about this. Do we know um, much about the LCA? No, we don't know much about the LCA, but uh, we can try to find ways to estimate and to infer um, uh, um, evolutionary processes, including the LCA. That's what we uh, try to do here in this paper by my student, uh, João de Oliveira Coelho. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a very nice study um, where the objective was to understand how the trend of time estimates uh, have changed from 1967 to 2021, right? And if these estimates are currently still supported or rejected by the fossil record, because people keep citing and citing the same papers or the same dates uh, of six to four million years as the, as the range uh, for this divergence. Uh, timing. So when you look at this today, this, this, this still holds. So our sample size here includes 193 different divergence estimates collected from the scientific literature. And if we filter or truncate the data set by the paleontological evidence, we get another, a different data distribution. So if you look at the red threshold, this is if either Australopithecus anamensis or uh, Ardipithecus ramidus are hominins. Um, if yes, this shifts the distribution to older dates of the late Miocene, then the orange threshold is if we consider Ardipithecus cadaver or Aurorin tugenensis as hominins. And finally, if Cylanthropus is an hominin, then it pushes the divergence event back to the earliest part of the late Miocene. So we uh, uh, are proposing um, that, yeah, that this event may probably happen 8 million years ago or um, before 8 million years ago. Uh, and actually, so when you look at the actual data, it, it, what shows is really strikingly different from what most researchers continue to cite when uh, writing about um, uh, this topic. Okay, and when we talk about the LCA um, morphology, um, when we talk about the LCA morphology, um, which obviously we don't know because we haven't found him, um, uh, we, we, we have um, recent uh, argument, uh, arguments from Pilbum and Lieberman that actually uh, are going back to what used to be the mainstream view that um, viewed as a whole, the current data does not really support those arguments that the LCA differed very substantially from chimpanzees um, and gorillas. So basically, in a nutshell, they are saying if, if one accepts parsimony as a useful principle, then the most probably hypothesis continues to be that the LCA of humans and chimpanzees generally resembled pan. 
and gorilla in many aspects of habitat and anatomy and was very much like pan in terms of size. So we are back to pan as a potentially good model for um, morphological and behavioral adaptations of uh, the LCA. Talking about um, the LCA behaviors, uh, there isn't much we can say, uh, but we can infer some behaviors using parsimony and using um, uh, uh, models uh, from extant primates. And in fact, uh, we have hypothesized that one uh, behavior we believe uh, the LCA would not be prevented from doing is uh, being um, a tool user. Uh, and so uh, being a technological um, creature, um, I think uh, we cannot discard, obviously, convergent evolution in, expl in explaining uh, some of the tool users we see in the primate order. But it is possible that uh, um, the LCA uh, was a tool user uh, given that uh, what we see in PAN is to use as a generalized feature of uh, the genus with huge differences in frequency and types of tools, but it's very much present uh, in every community that has been studied. So there is, I think, good grounds to say, we are not saying the LCA was a tool user, but the LCA had nothing preventing him from being a tool user. And this is also uh, based on, obviously, on morphological um, reconstructions um, of the LCA that I just uh, talked about. So possibly a tool user, possibly using tools um, made of organic perishable materials that uh, would not uh, fossilize. Uh, and that's a huge bias that is now being addressed by uh, the archaeology uh, of the perishable as I speak. Um, let's talk about diversity just looking at the example of material records, which is what is mostly used for behavioral reconstructions, as you know, um, and to access complexity and diversity in, in humans. So uh, we have material uh, culture uh, for non-humans, as you can see uh, in the in the diagram there, and you can see that for several of them there is depth, so there has been a dated excavation, so we know how old or how potentially how old is uh, nut cracking in Pan uh, and in uh, genus Sapagius. Um, so now think, look at this and think of the chimpanzee record for stone tools. Um, if, if, you're, if you're digging a site, and all you have are stone tools. Think about this diagram. The, the chimpanzee uh, record is 4,000 years old and all uh, you can find are uh, stone tools. And you will say, I, I know because I have done these sites that these assemblages are very similar. They don't show much variability, even though that some variability may be present, but they don't show much variability. Um, so you would say, this is the, the the chimpanzee record is not diverse at all, but because I study chimpanzees and I can record their modern behavior, I know their behavioral behavioral repertoire is extremely diverse and extremely complex. Uh, the same can be said for modern humans: very diverse behavior, but very low diversity, genetic and otherwise. So I think this was my um, main point uh, with this uh, diagram. So let's talk here uh, about diversity, looking at the example of uh, material records in modern chimpanzees. In this paper that is reporting on behavioral and cultural uh, diversity decline uh, due to human impact. And I just would like uh, us to consider the possibility that if material culture diversity can be used to measure or predict extinction of species in the past, which we do with archaeology, then could we use the current record of PAN to infer past diversity and how close to extinction they may be today? Um, this, of course, would raise a problem to access uh, hominins, given that, uh, given what we see between Pan troglodytes and Pan paniscus today, we cannot really assume that behavioral innovation is um, reflected um, by material culture, 
uh, when we know the behavioral repertoire uh, that uh, does not include tools is invisible, but it's it's there and it's quite vast and complex. So talking about um, diversity and uh, variability, um, uh, this is an interesting uh, study by Amy Callan last year uh, showing that environmental variability seems to be a driver of diversity uh, for uh, chimpanzee um, behavioral diversity. Uh, so basically, uh, the, the, the paper is on one side reminding us that population diversification precedes genetic divergence and speciation um, and is telling us that environmental variability may be a critical evolutionary force promoting the behavioral and cultural diversification uh, in great tapes, which I think it's um, quite relevant uh, to uh, our discussion. This is both in uh, recent and historical uh, timescales. And then uh, another very interesting preprint by Erin Vessling looking at something super critical at the moment for us, the limits of pan-ecological flexibility. What are they? And this is showing for um, Fongoli, Senegal, which is the most, uh, the, the, the driest habitat where chimpanzees live. It's showing that chimpanzees that are living um, at the limit of their home range have less uh, available uh, flora, less habitat variation, heterogeneity, and less uh, options of canopy uh, where they can uh, get uh, refugee from high temperatures uh, than the chimpanzees that are within the range limit. Uh, the data is also showing that there is a decline in chimpanzee density within increasing proximity to this range limit. So I think this is a, a very interesting indication of, um, of the limits uh, for the species uh, in terms of uh, food diversity, refugee, water availability. Um, and I think this is something really to think about when we are thinking about chimpanzee biogeography. Um, just to go very briefly back to uh, talk about hominin diversity and sympathy, giving the example of a paper uh, we also published recently, where we uh, report on this uh, high diversity uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, a certain time frame, the Okote member of Kobe 4 in Kenya, where you have four um, hominin species present at the same time. And so four species at one time in the same overall ecosystem um, where we can know or infer about their behavioral variation, right? Because we know there are differences in technology, uh, locomotor adaptations with the new uh, material that came out recently from Paranthropus, um, dietary adaptations, so we can infer variation. However, interestingly, these studies um, this type of evidence is still mostly lacking for extant apes. Um, and I think we do need to study simultaneous uh, sympatric populations of primates within um, the same ecosystem, uh, and especially maybe the ones that are more likely uh, to overlap resources, uh, say Pan and Papio, uh, that actually overlap are present at many long-term sites, but you have researchers studying chimpanzees and researchers studying Papio at those sites and not necessarily uh, um, doing cross-comparative studies. I'm not saying they don't exist, I say they, they are very rare. Um, and so approaching the end of the talk, to talk about which primates are the, the best model, Rob talked about that, the, the, is a chimpanzee really a good model? Uh, I'm going to argue that depends very much on what you seek to model and give the example of what I have been doing, which is to model technological origins. If you do that, um, of course, you want to study this behavior across taxa to understand convergence and to place the, the behaviors in its ecological contexts. Um, but what we do here with technology can be done very much with anything behavioral. Um, but um, I think an interesting potential avenue to explore um, would be to get at diversity in the biogeography of PAN using technological evolution as an indicator of diversity and time depth. But um, if 
you, what what you seek is to look at adaptations adaptations that emerge in seasonal complex environments and under varied degrees of predation pressure then you probably wouldn't use pan because with some exceptions uh, they do not range in the most seasonal or markedly seasonal in complex environments um, those uh, would be probably environments like the Gorongosa National Park um, and the environments where you have Miombo woodland and uh, that type of vegetation. So uh, so when you look at this type of, uh, uh, of study, uh, then not many terrestrial primates are really highly adaptable to mosaic environments that are highly seasonal, as I said. Um, for example, Gorongosa floods uh, uh, um, 40% of plus every year, but uh, these primates that we have in Gorongosa are highly adapted to this. So in this case, the baboons of Gorongosa seemed really an excellent target to try to address questions of how we evolved some of our key adaptations that seem to make us uh, such a successful primate. Okay, and uh, to finish, uh, to conclude uh, my talk, um, I think you have heard more than enough from me. Uh, I would like to conclude by uh, saying that when we find a fossil record between 8 and 10 million years, when we map much more of the behavioral diversity in modern apes, including non tool use related behaviors, but that could leave trace traces behind, when we reaccess potentially some hominin material, when we change survey exploration areas in Africa, when we start looking at examples of sympathy today between Gorilla Pan and behavioral overlaps and differences with other sympatric primates, when we manage to decrease the research bias reflecting really how much effort has been dedicated to find dominance versus finding anything else, then I think we will have finally some of the answers we have been looking for for a long time. For that, I think we really need to change the way we are uh, doing research and implement uh, what I like to call holistic approaches uh, that is well represented by this um, wonderful figure by Luis da Silva um, that represents the multiple avenues of uh, research and disciplines we are um, making use and exploring in uh, the uh, Paleo Primate project in Gorongosa, Mozambique, that we are currently undertaking. Thank you so much, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Robert and Susanna, for your stimulating and engaging talks. Um, plenty to think about, plenty to discuss, and so I'm sure that we'll have uh, plenty of questions as well. Uh, we already have a few. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, please feel free to use the chat to, to give us your questions, and then we'll pass them on to uh, both Susanna and, and, and Robert, okay? So, would it be okay for me to start and passing on some of the questions that we have? Yeah? Okay, so first question uh, by Mark Collard. Uh, question for all. When we just look at the genetic estimates of diversification, why are baboons so different to chimps, gorillas, and humans? Are they less prone to extinction? <laughs> Hi, Mark. Um, yeah, um, that, that, it's a really good question, I, and I've pondered the same. I think I mean, <clears throat> what I should have done, but I was far too lazy, uh, was to plot onto the same graph the, um, the fossil record for, for um, baboons to see how that matches on, because we know there's a good one. My guess is, uh, that they are, they are they are much less prone to extinction, and that does make sense given that you know the, the habitats that they are adapted to. As Susanna was talking about them; these rather more open, drier environments are are, are expanding during most of these periods, and baboons are, are, are very adaptable. So, so 
the simple answer is yes, I would expect the explanation to be that. I mean, I think it's more likely that than to say that the, that the chimps and the gorillas are not diversifying earlier on. I think they're just diversifying and we're losing that at a much higher rate. Because I now want to know whether Mark, okay. agrees with, Mark agrees with me or not. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know if you want to add something, then or not, if, or if I can go on. No, I, I, you can go on. I agree fully with, uh, with Rob. I just think um, Papio uh, likely underwent less extinction than uh, past great tapes. We don't know, right? We don't know. But... Uh, and that maybe uh, Papu follows much more closely the pattern that we see in hominins, given the common adaptations to very similar environments. And I think some of the data that we have in the fossil record uh, of analogous uh, primates, when we talk, for example, Theropithecus, which you find in uh, so many uh, uh, fossil sites that have Homo, um, that may be also an indicator that we, I think what I talked about, about that migration potentially inland and who made it there and who evolved adaptations to, uh, to those types of uh, uh, habitats that are potentially more variable uh, and pose different challenges. I think all of that uh, uh, potentially applies to um, the ancestors of uh, Papio. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Susanna. Let me just manage this. Um, okay, a second question uh, from God. Uh, what are the characters that distinguish early hominins from other apes, justifying the start of a subfamily, and does this really matter? <laughs> oh, you, want me, you want me to do that, Susanna? Or do you yes, please, please, please start. Please start. I mean, I think, uh, so, I mean, there, there are two different issues that that, that that come up there. One is what, you know, what distinguishes one lineage from another. It's gen I, I I think the standard answer is that what we're calling the hominins is um, is bipedalism uh, and, and and things like reduced canines uh, seem to be the, the morphological characteristics that we're most likely to, to pick up. Uh, it's not a, necessarily clear that we know that those were not you know present in earlier ancestors. So it's the the presence of those. I think. Conversely, I don't think we we really have a definition of what distinguishes an ape from or the ancestor, the common ancestor of, of 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 humans, chimps, and gorillas from earlier possible apes. We simply don't have the evidence as to which taxonomic level it should be. I mean, I think we always have to remember that taxonomic levels are, are, are above the level of species are ultimately relatively arbitrary, uh, and I think where the the, the justification for the distinction between the two, I think lies less in any difference we might find back five million years ago, but in a sense, what happened subsequently. Um, and and there's, there's, there is disagreement amongst the, the community as to whether the distinction is a tribal one or a subfamily one. I think these days, are, although, although we usually get the spelling wrong, I think these days, most people think it's a tribe difference and so not quite as significant, but, you know, it's, it's uh, there is an arbitrariness there, I have to admit. Mm -hmm. I think, yes, I think uh, um, Rolf said the essentials again. Um, I think when we talk hominins, it's getting um, more and more difficult, right? When, uh, when we talk about what uh, is unique or distinctive of, of hominins, I think it's, uh, it's getting quite difficult, especially uh, because of one thing you were saying, Rob, where uh, we have uh, yeah, we have arguments, at least, for some apes in the Miocene to, to, to display some form of clambering bipedalism, or in, and in other cases, uh, displaying uh, a reduction in the canines. I think the, what is the difference is that you don't find both traits simultaneously um, until you get Ominins, or that's what we like to think. And I think uh, we are very much down to these two, the, the canine reduction along with the, with the evidence for some form of bipedal locomotion as the two traits that define 
the whole hominin clade when we want to talk about something that is present across the whole uh, spectrum of, of uh, uh, genera and species, right? But I think this discussion would take a long time. I mean, it, it depends if you're talking about genetics, morphology, uh, et cetera, that are numerous things that distinguish hominins from uh, great tapes. Again, here I would call the, the big problem we have of comparing apples with oranges, because we are constantly comparing the depth of the hominin record with what we see as modern uh, evolutionary products uh, uh, in great apes. Um, so, so that makes it uh, quite difficult to compare. But if you compare modern great apes and modern humans, then you would uh, also pick, I think, on um, substantial differences in, uh, um, uh, in ecological niches, in, in, uh, in, in how great apes um, change and transform their uh, ecological niches versus uh, modern humans. And like Rob said, uh, those behavioral uh, adaptations uh, can uh, be very critical to explain uh, processes of diversity and speciation. Okay, thank you so much for your answers. Um, Mark would like to um, get back to you on the answer. <laughs> Is it okay if he, if he um, responds directly? Go, go for it, Mark. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, okay, I'll just unmute you. Yeah. Good morning. Great. Good uh, morning. Thoroughly enjoyable talk, so I guess it's good afternoon or good evening for you guys. Good morning for me. Um, happy St. George's Day, by the way. We noticed. Um, <laughs> so I guess what I was trying to get at is... Um, I think if we, you know, if we sort of combine both the genetics and the fossil side of things, we end up with a rather confused picture. But if we just focus on the genetics, um, one of the things that comes out that's quite interesting in, in Rob's presentation is this difference between uh, baboons and humans in terms of the, the recency of diversification. And so it's really that the, I, th I think the question there is, why are the baboons um, different from the humans or different from humans in terms of the recency of diversification? Is the implication of that that, that baboons are less prone to extinction than hominins? Not less prone to extinction oh. than, than uh, hominins, okay. Less prone to extinction than hominins. And that seems to run completely counter to the sort of Potsian view of, of human evolution in terms of increasing uh, behavioral flexibility it just sort of it seems like an interesting um, and counterintuitive thing to fall out of rob's analysis yeah no i mean that's a bit, sorry I'm, I'm i misunderstood your the question earlier because i thought it was the comparison with the apes the comparison with the humans is, is really interesting um so i think uh, yes i mean i, I think it, i haven't really put, put it in that way but my guess is it, it, it well it doesn't necessarily suggest that what Potts is saying is wrong, just says that you know, the Potts model uh, of, of, of um, sustainability, of, of resi resilience, uh, doesn't just influence, say, brain size, but other, other ad adaptations. I think the real thing is baboons are incredibly flexible um, and they are smaller body size, they have higher reproductive rates, so they're intrinsically more resilient against extinction uh, than other, than, than hominins. So I think, I mean, that's where I would put my money uh, the, the baboons are uh, just very adaptable um, and they have high reproductive rates. Uh, I mean, the, a slightly tongue-in-cheek answer would be to say, well, the baboons haven't had their modern human moment. That is where modern humans <laughs> evolved and, and, and things ra you know, went all over Africa uh, and beyond, replacing the archaic forms. And you know, when the modern human, the modern baboon, uh, <laughs> With its you know use of marine resources or something comes along it may be curtains for the older level of of, of baboon diversity now that's slightly tongue-in-cheek but it does okay. say that of course one of the influences on on extinction within a lineage is the arrival of new adaptations which are competitively superior mm -hmm. um so i think that's i think now i mean i, I might throw this at jonathan if because i remember there was a a thing years ago and it was Bob Brain's son whose name I can't remember who studied baboons in the Kalahari and they would they were long-term studies showing the population expanded out into the deep into the Kalahari um, but then 
you know, it was so extreme, rather like Fongoli, that they died out. And then 20, 30 years later, another population would move in. So I think these expansions, local extinctions, uh, probably would happen to the baboons, but perhaps not on quite the same scale. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Um, okay, so now one other question from uh, Cesar Alvarez. Uh, this is for Robert. Um, so do you think, uh, well, basically, if uh, we are still evolving, do you think you, that uh, in the future Homo sapiens will evolve more characteristics than the ones that we have already or not? If so, uh, what do you think that will be different? <laughs> 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 These questions are always, I don't know why this is addressed to me. I think Susanna <laughs> well, should be uh, up for this one. Um, I, I, my, my answer to questions about future evolution is, 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 is always the same, and it's got two elements to it. One is, I think the human population, at, at, what are we now, we're approaching 8 billion, uh, is, is too large to evolve. Um, I mean, the inertia in, in, in the system is such that uh, it, it's very unlikely. So without a major demographic collapse, it's difficult to see how uh, major or, or fundamental eugenics, something like that, uh, that, that could really cause that. Um, and the other thing, of course, is, is the direction of evolution is entirely dependent upon the selective environment. So if the selective environment for humans in a thousand, a million years time is one of, let's say, if, you know, global global heat, overheating, then there might be stream selection for temperature survival. If on the other hand, it's one uh, of, you know, deep urbanization across the whole planet, uh, we would have a, a different set of traits that would be selected for. So the, I mean, my answer is always a disappointing one was that, you know, I, I don't know until I know what the selective uh, landscape in which this, our, our future species is likely to evolve. But I mean, until we, Hopefully, don't. But until we have a, a serious population crash, I think it's unlikely much will happen. Uh, okay, I don't know if you want to add something, Susanna, or if I can. Why not? Why not? <laughs> I think this is um, uh, a bit <laughs> that we can do pure speculation because we 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 don't know. But I think um, haven't we all been thinking a lot about this during the pandemic? I think probably we have. I mean, we have, um, you know. Uh, overpopulation of a single species. So on one hand, I think um, the demographics and definitely our technological um, dependency, but, but also complexity is buffering us for a few million years against um, a number of, um, of, of constraints, ecological and otherwise. And I think that's that's present at the moment, but at the same time, I also do think that we are, um, or we could be considered at the moment to be quite vulnerable. And uh, you know, one single species, uh, low uh, uh, diversity, low diversity, low genetic variation, um, uh, such a young species compared with Australopithecines that were around for more than than two million years. I mean, I was thinking of this when Rob talked about you talk about the coalescence times for uh, uh, um, for Pan, etc. That actually, if you look at Homo sapiens, it's it's very you know very very young, um, and so um, I agree uh, that it's unlikely that uh, many events will lead to the disappearance of uh, Homo sapiens or uh, to have an event of speciation, we would have to have massive population crashes and isolations, pockets of populations in some places. And uh, yeah, and this would be an evolutionary process probably taking a very long time, uh, but it's not, it's not impossible to, and, and when, you th when you think about what could potentially um, provoke this, given our uh, current adaptations and how uh, widespread we are and how resilient we are as a species, uh, probably uh, um, uh, a global pandemic uh, or uh, something of, or I think actually lack of resources, that would be um, something to seriously consider, right? Lack of resources, um, of key resources, probably more than uh, any um, disease uh, would be something that could lead to such a um, major catastrophic change. Okay, cheers. Um, 
Okay, now the next one is directed to you, Susanna. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, from Mujita, Mujita Peirteu. Um, uh, quoting, uh, you mentioned that it is a myth that preservation of fossils is poor in tropical environments. But isn't it the case that warm, humid, heavy rain, biodiverse, rich ecosystems offer the best conditions for fast decay, poor preservation of fossils? Can we be hopeful of finding fossil evidence in these environments? Um, okay, yes and no, I think, which means um, the, the conditions, there are many different uh, explanations and conditions that lead to the wonderful fossilization uh, that, uh, that occurs in a lot of the East African reef system, for example, and that allow us to go around and, and find all those fossils like you saw in that Tikika picture. Those have to do, it's a mixture of tectonics, but it's also the fact that you had in many cases very quick, um, uh, very quick uh, eruptions, massive eruptions of volcanoes that very quickly buried uh, whatever go, was present in the landscape, right? Also that you, in those cases, in, in most cases you have, you're talking about low energy environments, especially in these areas we're talking about inland, low energy environments, uh, fluvial, uh, uh, close to lakes, uh, where things are unlikely to go very far away, to move too much after they are buried. So um, of course that is, I'm not claiming that um, in highly vegetated environments that are, are, are um, flood seasonally or uh, have, um, have a constant presence of water, high levels of humidity. It's not the only reason uh, soils are acidic, uh, very acidic, so they uh, tend not to preserve uh, organic uh, uh, material so well. Um, and there is also the question of the time of the geological deposits that we have in some of these areas. Um, and that is, you know, regardless of the, the vegetation type, let's say that you see at the moment, even though, um, even though obviously uh, vegetation type can be an indicator of soil type and that can be also an indicator of uh, the type of uh, preservation you can expect in some of these cases. However, we have plenty of plenty, when people do dedicate the efforts, so say it takes you uh, I'm going to throw a random number out there, maybe a hundred times more effort to find a fossil site in Gorongosa than to find a very good fossil site uh, in uh, Dikika or Kobifora that you can publish for 20 years. Um, but that fossil record from Gorongosa is going to fill uh, information that is absolutely key and that probably 50 sites in the usual place are not going uh, to fill. We have examples, for example, from the Amazonian Peru um, of uh, uh, a very well known and studied uh, 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 mammalian fauna uh, from the Paleogene from the Amazonian Peru. So there are, there are uh, some Eocene primates also that have been uh, found in um, uh, South, um, South America, also in uh, similar uh, conditions in terms of vegetation. So these things are there and they can be um, they can fossilize and they can last. It depends very much in which conditions were present at the time of fossilization. And then of course, a bit of luck so that the, 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 the taphonomic processes and all the natural damage that occurs after fossilization allows you to uh, uh, still find them. But yes, I mean, I'm going to stop here. I, I hope I answered the question more or less. I think so. Um... Okay, now from Gopesh Jha, sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Um, question to Rob. Amazing talk, Professor Foley. The records showing nature and speed of progression of environment, biological evolution and diversity, cultural evolution and diversity are very different. Yet these factors are highly interconnected. How hard and inappropriate is it to put all these factors i.e. Uh, paleo-environment, uh, technology, fossils, genetics, in one-to-one -one alignment. How careful should we be uh, while correlating these different factors, different data, to build one common story? 
how hard yeah. is it to bring all of this together? That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a, a quite a question. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, there was, there, there was a careful putting together of two words there that I want to actually take apart. And one is how hard it is, is it, and how appropriate is it? Uh, and I think it is hard, um, I think without any doubt, uh, but it, I think it's entirely appropriate. Um, in the end, there has to be a, a single evolutionary history. I mean, it's not as if there's a different one for technology and a different one uh, for the biology. It's the individuals with that biology who are making the stone tools. So we've got to search for a single history. That now, I think I think there's another thing I would I would say. It is correlated in the sense that there's there has to be a relationship between these different elements, which doesn't mean it's not the same as saying that they're correlated in time. So, in other words, that it could be that there is a significant relationship between you know, the appearance of a new technology and a dispersal, but it could be there's a gap between it of you know ten years, a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years between those two. So, but if that systematic relationship remains, then it, there is a correlation, but it's not necessarily synchronous. So I, I've never never argued that we should be looking for kind of synchronous events across the fossil record. But we, we should be looking for the relationships between the, 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 the two of them. And you know, it's going to be a very complicated story. It's a, you know, it's a phrase I've used frequently as a common one in evolutionary biology. Human evolution is a mosaic evolution. Different things evolve at different times, at different rates. Uh, but we, we, we need to use the, you know, the, the various proxies there are to try and put the story uh, together. So go back. I mean, it's hard. Um, but it wouldn't be so much fun if it wasn't hard. Uh, but it is, is, I think, an entirely appropriate goal to, 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 to try and achieve. Thank you. Susanna, do you want to add something? No, not really. I, I think we can move on. Okay, okay. Uh, now from Vivian. Um, Susanna mentioned that technology is currently used in archaeology to predict diversity, uh, if I have not misunderstood. Um, what sort of work is she referring to? I suppose uh, some references, some specific studies. Um, some specific studies. Uh, I think uh, we have, I think what archaeologists um, do most of the time when analyzing different assemblages across time, um, and um, so diachronically and synchronically, uh, is really to look at the material culture. So let me take a step back and make a statement to say that most archaeological assemblages prior to, um, to modern humans, really, but at least during the old one and the Oshulian, um, a lot of the archaeology we're talking about is not directly associated with hominins. Okay, I think this is a, a myth also that uh, people many times have that uh, uh, we are talking about assemblages that are um, very well directly associated with a certain species, and they are not. So in most cases, you have the tools and you don't have the hominins, or you have uh, an hominin that was found uh, uh, nearby, uh, and that you suggest, as in the case of Kenyanthropus platyops in relation to the findings of Lomequi, that this may have been the tool user. Um, in uh, publications, um, for example, um, I'm thinking of, um, local alley uh, with the old one, uh, where different sites of the same age are, are, are proposed to have to show such different complexity in the process of producing tools in the, in the, in the where one is much more less uh, complex and has much less um, steps in the reduction process. And the other is extremely uh, complex for what is normally the pattern in the old one, and that is proposed um, to be uh, a sign of diversity. Diversity, uh, I'm talking about cultural diversity, right? This could be within the same species or um, um, different species. Um, and that's something that um, we know very little. And that's why archaeologists um, rely very much on what they have, which is the material record, but also are starting to look out uh, to what we can see from, a, from, for example, extant apes using tools or extant primates, better said, using tools in what kind of diversity in technology you see. And if that is a sign 
um, if you can have any um, connection with, uh, I think what Rob was saying in terms of biology and material culture, say for example, um, chimpanzees in Guinea, where I studied two different sites, they use stone tools to process different net species. And those material records look very different in terms of uh, um, typology. So the shape and uh, the size of those tools uh, is very different. Uh, it's 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 completely it's these are two different assemblages contemporaneous um, used and uh, not produced but used by the same uh, species of chimpanzee just different uh, communities. Cheers. Um, I think we have time for two more questions. Another one is from Chris Gorman. Um, is there any good evidence of hominin, hominid type coexistence without a relative rapid replacement event? Sorry, okay. what? Hominid, hominid. Hominid. That's what it's <laughs> written here. <laughs> it's one of those questions which it de depends on your taxonomy. Uh, 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 with a D at the end, hominid. With a D at the end. So, yeah. so sympatry between across the apes and hominids. Well, obviously, we have it contemporaneously. Uh, we have absolutely zero evidence in the past. I mean, there's only one chimpanzee fossil uh, two to 300,000. So, so it's very difficult to answer. So I'm going to cheat and assume the D wasn't there and say, <laughs> <laughs> an and say if you look across the hominin lineage, um, in other words, yeah. then, then, then yes, there is a lot of evidence for sympatry across taxa. Uh, and even as recently as um, as the last uh, quarter of a million years, we know uh, that there was certainly, I mean, it depends quite what we mean by sympatry, but certainly there was more than one taxa of hominin in Africa at that time. Um, so so we, I think we can say uh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. How, you know, one of the interesting questions which no one's really studied is how long that sympatry genuinely lasts, which I think we, we, we simply don't know at the moment. Mm. I think, you know, so that's true. I think that's, that, that's, that, that's true also for the, um, the data I showed from uh, the Okoti member in the copy for affirmation where you get uh, four different um, hominins and from different genera uh, in the same area, roughly at the same time. And I suppose if you accept the idea that Cylanthropus can be much older and was overlapping with other, potentially with other African great tapes at a time, that could be also something to consider speculatively. Okay, so one last question to, to, to wrap up. I don't know how long this will take, but I would like to ask it anyways. Uh, where do you think that future research should focus to improve our understanding of human evolution? Where do you think we should drive our efforts towards? <laughs> Susanna can go first. <laughs> Okay, I think I think I said that in the end of um, my talk, um, but I definitely think that we need to um, find a way to have a much less sparse fossil record, um, and that includes working in new places um, and working in the time frames that actually can solve some can help solving some of these of these uh, problems. Um, ideally. Um, we would also uh, like to, we would need uh, and hope that what we are doing helps uh, to change this limited understanding of modern behavioral ecology uh, by paleoanthropologists. I think this has really, I, I, of course I am a suspect to talk about this, but I think this has led really to minimal integration um, of paleontological and primate behavioral data with exceptions like Rob. Uh, Rob's career and others, there are very few people doing this. And uh, it's a, and we are in extinction, I think. There are very few people doing this. I think that is a, a potentially a bias against the researchers that are generalists in terms of, you know, instead of specialists. So uh, if, you, if you cover all these areas, then probably you're not good at any of them. And I really think these generalists are essential 
to make the links and to make the bridges and to speak the same language across all these disciplines that uh, we need to um, we need to get together to get a much better picture of of uh, of our uh, past uh, history. And I think also the development of new methods and techniques um, is going to be uh, critical. I think in the future that can enable um, better and faster. Uh, uh, co uh, collection and processing of data sets. I mean, across the range, not only fossils, but for primate behavior. Um, and I think that's coming up with artificial intelligence and other things. And, and that's going to be also a, a game changer. But ultimately, we need more fossils. We need more people focus on not finding hominins, but finding actually the record that can uh, fill the gaps. Um, and we need more paleoanthropologists that want to hear about uh, modern animal behavior and spend time looking at modern ecology. Um, I, I, I fully Thanks. agree. Um, I, I think I, I, this is, what I'm going to say is entirely against my own interests. Um, but I think what, what really will make the difference is, is young people, because I think it's the job of young people to challenge, you know, to challenge the orthodoxies. So the insights in human evolution, new ones will come from young people coming along and saying, hey, you old guys, what you've done is wrong. Um, and, 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 and they're going to do that through all the methods that, uh, that, that um, Susanna said. And of them, I, you know, going out and finding fossils is, is, is key. Uh, I think that has to be one of them. But I would also very much encourage people uh, to, to, to really know the breadth of the discipline. You know, Susanna's mentioned it. You know, if you're an archaeologist, you still have to know the genetics. If you're a geneticist, you still have to know the fossils. Uh, and you, everybody needs to know the ecology. Um, so I, I, I encourage young people to go and be, uh, um, uh, uh, go and challenge, challenge the models that we have, because that's where I think new insights will come from. Never lose, fo never lose focus of the big picture. <laughs> they're very important. <laughs> well, <laughs> once again, I want to thank you, Robert and Susanna, for for being with us and sharing all the information and knowledge that you that you have. Uh, it was very, very good, very, very enriching. Um, so thank you once again, and thanks to everyone for for joining us in this session. Also, please join the next session of the Caribs Dialogues. It will be on May twenty first, and it will look into coastal adaptations with Clervia Yaouen. Sorry if I misspell this, and Eric Fisher, um, who will uh, we. Which will be con in this session will be convened by Vera Aldeias, who is a researcher here at Ticare. So once again, thank you to our two uh, guests and to everyone who joined us in this in this um, in this session.